In this video, we're going to look at the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Fundamental theorem of calculus has two parts. In this video, we're only going to look at part one, and there'll be a separate video for part two. So, what's the big idea behind the fundamental theorem of calculus? is that these two things that we've learned about differentiation and integration are in a sense inverses of each other they undo each other in other words in a sense if you start with a function take its derivative then integrate the derivative you're going to be back to the original function or on the other hand if you start with a function and you take the integral of that function and then you differentiate, you're going to get the original function back again. And so it's not exactly like an algebraic inverse, but it is uh, very close and it's going to help us, this idea is going to help us evaluate definite integrals. But we need to get there a, a little bit carefully. And so uh, that's really in part two when we see how we can use this uh, fundamental theorem. Here in part one, we're going to build up the machinery or build up the information that we need to use in part two. So in order to understand the concepts in the fundamental theorem of calculus, we need to introduce a new way of defining a function. And we define it using a definite integral, which is really going to represent areas. So suppose I have a function g of x, which is defined in the following manner my x is actually the upper bound of an integral. So I have a different function, f of t, whose graph is shown here, just for this example. And we're going to say that uh, g of x is defined as the definite integral from 2 to x of f of t dt. So if I wanted to find the uh, value of g of x, I would need to evaluate this integral. And since I have the graph, I can evaluate it by just remembering how to calculate the area under the curve and remembering that the area uh, below the x-axis or the t-axis here, below the horizontal axis counts as negative. I can also see that the uh, because my function f is only defined between negative 2 and 8, that really my domain of g is limited to x being between negative 2 and 8. All right, so let's do some examples. What is g of 2? Well, from the definition, that would be the integral from 2 to 2 of f of t dt. And I know that if my upper bound and my lower bound are equal, then the value of the integral is 0. So g of 2 equals 0. What would be g of 4? Well, g of 4 would be the integral from 2 to 4 of f of t dt. So all I'm looking at there would be the integral, I mean the integral, the area of this triangle right here. And so I use the formula half base times height, and the base is two squares. Each square here represents one unit, both on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. So this triangle is two squares in the base, two squares in the height, 
And so its area is two. So G of four equals two. And let's do G of eight. Now, so G of eight is the definite, definite integral from two to eight. So now, not only do I have this triangle, which goes from two to four, I would have this triangle going from four to six, and then this square, which goes from six to eight. And the red shaded triangle and the square are below the vertical axis, so I would count those as negatives. So this would be a positive. I'd have a negative and a negative. And I can see that um, the area of the triangle above the t-axis is the same as the area of the triangle below. Both have a base and height of 2. So really, that's going to make 0. And I should only be left with the negative of the area of the green shaded square, which would be negative 4. So that's what I did. Broke those up into three parts. And I had 2 and then minus 2. Of course, that made the 0. And then minus 4. So g of 8 is negative 4. And finally, g of 0. So with g of 0, I'd have the definite integral from 2 to 0. And I have to be careful here because of the bounds here. The lower bound is actually bigger than the upper bound. So to evaluate that using the area, I need to have uh, the upper bound larger than the lower bound, which is fine. I can switch the bounds, but I just need to remember to change the sign of the integral. And so uh, then from uh, negative 2 to 0, uh, I would just have this shape right here, which I could look at as a triangle plus a square. Or uh, I just use the formula for a trapezoid. So remember, for a trapezoid, the area is 1 half h, parentheses, a plus b. A and B are the lengths of the parallel sides. H is the distance between them. So the distance between the parallel sides is 2. And the short parallel side is 2. And the long parallel side is 6. And that's where I, those numbers came from. And then I can work that out. And I get negative 8. So it's kind of interesting that uh, you know at, at 0, G is negative. Then at 2, it becomes 0. At 4, it's positive. But back at 8, it's negative again. It's just interesting that it varies between uh, you know, negative and positive like that. Let's look at another example where I have an area function. So in this case, m is a constant. And we're thinking of m as being the slope of a line. So m times t, mt, y equals mt is the equation of a line passing through the origin with slope m. Well, when we talked about the area problem, we actually found the area under uh, such a line. And uh, we didn't even need to use the definition, but we went ahead and used the definition and we said that if I have f of t equals mt, we went through this definition and we found out that uh, from a, so from a to b, so from 0 to b, uh, the area would be mb squared over 2, or 1 half mb squared. 
And so now in this case, my upper bound is not B, my upper bound is X. So it would be one half MX squared. So this function here, which is defined as the uh, integral of from zero to x of mt dt, we have uh, that g of x uh, could be written as one half mx squared. And now we're starting to get a hint of how differentiation and integration undo each other because I have an integral, which is essentially, well, m times t, it's still y equals f of t equals mt. Uh, after I integrate it, I get one half mx squared. And if I differentiate that, I'm back to mx. So it's a different letter, but it is the same function. g prime of x is the same as f of x. Or if I were to change this to g prime of t, it would be the same thing as f of t. All right. So now let's look at this idea of differentiating. So taking a function, integrating that function, and then finding the derivative of the resulting integral of the function. So here I have g of x. It's just a generic function here. I don't have a formula for this. It's just some generic continuous function. I'm taking the integral from some starting point a. It doesn't have to be 0 or 1. And down here, I just uh, selected a value of a at some arbitrary point. And I'm going to uh, take the integral of starting from a going to x of f of t dt. And just to make the uh, drawing simpler, uh, I made the uh, function here lie above the horizontal axis. But there's nothing about this analysis which requires that the uh, function could be above, below, or changing from above to below the t-axis. So if I want to take the derivative of this function, I need to go back to the definition. So instead of using h, I'm going to use delta x here. So I need to find the value of g of x plus delta x minus g of x, divide that by delta x, and then take the limit as delta x goes to zero. That's just the definition of the derivative, the limit definition. Well, let's look at these terms. What is g of x plus delta x? What is g of x? And what does their uh, difference look like geometrically? So g of x plus delta x, just from the definition of g of x, is the definite integral from a to the number x plus delta x. So that would be the area under our curve, starting at a, going up to x, then a little bit more, x plus delta x. So this rightmost dashed line right here, that area would be the value of g of x plus delta x. The value of g of x, that's what I'm subtracting off, is all of the area under the curve from a stopping at x. So the first dashed line on the right. So what's the difference between the two? Well, just this narrow strip between those dashed lines on the right. The width of that narrow strip is delta x. And the height of that strip is about, well, g of x. 
So here is my uh, narrow strip, which is the difference here between uh, g of x plus delta x minus g of x. It's this narrow strip, which I'm going to estimate the area of that narrow strip as a rectangle whose base is delta x and whose height is, in this case, the left endpoint, g of x. And so, and that is actually incorrect. The height of that is not g of x, and I misspoke previously. The height is the height, the y coordinate, but this is the graph of y equals f of t. So this is actually going to be f of x is the height. There we are. That's better. That makes sense. And that's what I wrote down here, that the uh, integral, so the difference here is just the integral where the lower bound is x, the upper bound is x plus delta x, and that is the area of this strip right here, and the area of that strip has, can be estimated by a rectangle whose base is delta x and whose height is f of x. So that's why I have delta x times f of x, and it's an estimate. That's why I have those squiggles right there. And so uh, the delta x will divide out. And just to be careful here, I could also include the limit here, delta x going to zero. But since the delta x divides out, uh, in the end, I get the same result, which is f of x. So let's, this verifies what we saw in the previous example, that if I start with a function and I integrate it with these particular bounds, I'll get a function g of x. If I take the derivative of that function evaluated at a specific value of x, I just get the original integrand or the original function back again evaluated at the value of x. So you start with a function, you perform an integral, you take the derivative of what you get after the integral, and you're back with the original function. So differentiation in this sense undoes integration. And that's what the fundamental theorem of calculus part one tells us. If you take a continuous function on a closed interval, define a new function g of x as this area function, the definite integral from a to x of f of t dt, then that function g of x is continuous and it's differentiable and its derivative is just the integrand evaluated at the value of x. So you start with f, you take the integral. If you take the derivative, you're going to get back to the function value at that value of x. So in our statement here, we said we needed to have a continuous function. Um, but it's OK if the, the uh, function f has a finite number of jump or removable discontinuities. So suppose I define g of x as the definite integral from 0 to x of radical 1 plus t squared dt. So if I use the fundamental theorem, then g prime of x is just going to be 1, radical 1 plus x squared, just the integrand evaluated at x. Now let's see what would happen uh, if I had a different function as my upper bound instead of just x. In this example, g of x is defined as the uh, definite integral from 0 to sine of x 
t squared dt. So I'm going to need to use the chain rule here. And let's see how that works. If I let u be the upper bound sine of x, then I could say that g as a function of u is the definite integral from 0 to u of t squared dt. And when it's written in this form, I can directly apply the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1. And I would get that g prime of u would just be the integrand evaluated at u. So I just get u squared. But I'm not interested in g prime of u. I want g prime of x. So well, the chain rule tells me that g prime of x can be found by taking g prime of u and multiplying it times u prime of x. So u prime of x, remember I said u was sine of x, so u prime will be cosine of x. And so I would get g prime of u, which I said is u squared, times u prime of x, which is cosine of x. And the only thing I have to remember is that I can't leave this in terms of u. I need to write it in terms of x, which is not a problem. u is sine of x, so let me replace u with sine of x, and I'll get that g prime of x equals sine squared x cosine of x. So now we'll be left with the uh, juicier part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, part two, where we're going to find a simpler way of evaluating definite integrals.